Hi, this is Paul Studenik from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, reporting for Roy Now from the virtual EULA Congress 2021. I'm uh, talking with Dr. James Galloway uh, from King's College London on his study with the uh, number OP0126, titled Infections and Serious Infections in the Filgotin and Rheumatoid Arthritis Program. So um, prospects on safety in Filgotin RA patients. So thank you, James, for taking the time being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me, Paul. Well, JAK inhibitors uh, have been another milestone in the treatment of ontarium uh, for inflammatory arthritis patients. And among the family of JAK inhibitors, filgotinib is you know, preventionally inhibiting JAK1. And it is... Uh, of patient safety is one of the major points to be addressed in novel treatments. So what can you tell us concerning infections or the risk of infections from the analysis of the data? Yeah, so thanks. So, so we've looked at data from across the trial program from the Philgotinib trials. So that, that includes the phase two trials and also the phase three. So there's three phase two trials and four phase three trials and also long-term extension data. We've, we've looked at inf infection rates overall. So this includes serious and non-serious infection rates and compared that between um, filgotinib at the two doses, 200 milligrams and 100 milligrams, because of course the license for filgotinib has the, the dose range in it. We've compared that to the placebo arms, which has got the relatively short placebo comparator, but then longer comparator data for methotrexate comparison, adalimumab comparison, um, and, and also some data from open label extension. The headlines are that the infection rates with filgotinib were numerically slightly higher than placebo, but actually they were numerically very low. When they're compared to methotrexate and adalimumab, the confidence intervals all overlap, and so the, the, the event rates are, are very reassuring. And we also did some work looking at event rates over time. Looks like you see, like we've seen with the other, uh, pretty much not just JAK inhibition, but across the board with immune modulation in, in rheumatoid, you see this early increase in risk that then set, settles down over time. So if people are going to have infections, it looks like the risk is greatest early on. Um, and then we also did, did some work to look at what predicted infection. So were there any characteristics of trial participants that predicted who was going to get infection? Quite a few things came out in the univariate analysis, which is sort of the, the usual suspects in terms of risk factors. But in the multivariate model, the, the one thing that stood out was a prior history of chronic lung disease uh, appeared to be the, the one thing that stood out. I, I should say that actually prior history of serious infection looked like it was getting very close as well. And I suspect that may have been missed just on a sample size effect because we had relatively small numbers who have got prior infection. So... Uh... From, from your feeling, um, how of, of all the things that we now know, how much uh, do we still don't know when it comes to improving, for instance, patient safety when we decide or want to consider uh, treating this particular patient with filgotinib? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of things, a couple of big gaps, I think, in, in our knowledge. One is we need to see real world data because we know that clinical trials tend to recruit uh, a select cohort of people, people who tend to be slightly healthier and perhaps slightly lower risk. So when we when we look at drug safety and pharmacovigilance, it's really important we get post-marketing pharmacovigilance data that builds our confidence, our strength and, and our understanding about these drugs. The other really big question, though, is how do the risks of filgotinib compare to other, other drugs in the class within JAK inhibition? I, I think we have this question of, is JAK1, is a JAK1 preferential drug going to have an advantage over drugs that have other selectivities in the, in the class? And numerically, if you look at the numbers, it, it does look like safety data may separate out with filgotinib looking slightly, based, slightly better in the safety profile. Um, but... We don't have head-to-head -head data. And I, I think until we get head-to-head -head data, I think we need to be very cautious in making those sorts of inferences. Um, the numbers are very short, reassuring. And, and there's a, a linked abstract on Zoster as well. And I, I think, if anything, the Zoster rates are perhaps slightly more convincing. They may be slightly lower with Filgotinib than with, um, than with the other JAK inhibitors. But I, I think time will tell. 
Well, good that you mentioned actually uh, Soster at, at the end, and even though it is linked to, to the poster that was also presented today, um, would you, so to say, uh, recommend, uh, independent of which class of check inhibitor to be used uh, to vaccinate, if possible, any patient before treatment? Yeah, so I, I think it, it is dependent on what you can get access to from the Zoster vaccine perspective. If you can access the, the subunit vaccine, the non-live vaccine, which has got very good efficacy data, um, and although it does look like it may have a slightly, it's a slightly more immunogenic vaccine, it's got very potent adjuvant in it. And, and um, But I, I think if, if I had access to the subunit vaccine, then I'd recommend anyone over 50 going on to targeted immunosuppression should be offered that. And in, in the UK, that's certainly been our recommendation, but we haven't pu published it yet because we don't have widespread access to that vaccine. And the live vaccine that is currently widely available in the UK, and I know in Europe, many countries have the, the similar situation. Um, we saw, for example, in the, um, in the oral study, so tofacitinib, they did some nested work. Kevin Winthrop presented this a couple of years ago, where they, they gave, um, it was in the oral standard trial, they gave a subgroup of people the, the live vaccine um, before starting on, on tofacitinib. And, and actually, it, it looked like um, people still developed Zoster despite that vaccine. We know even in immunocompetent people, the vaccine's efficacy is only in the 60s. It's only about 60% efficacious. So I think if your only access is to the, the live vaccine, I'm unsure about the evidence there. What I personally tend to do is, in the absence of access, accessing the subunit vaccine, I educate people about Zoster particularly people with a prior history of Zoster or people who you think are more vulnerable, I tend to give them a pack of um, valet cyclovir with instructions on when they would use that if they do develop symptoms and, and make sure they know how to handle it rather than pushing hard for vaccine, particularly with the live vaccine. Wonderful. So thank you for, for this uh, very uh, also clinical practical um, answer to that. And uh, just to let you know, uh, the, the, the poster uh, we were referring to is POS0092, if you want to have a closer look at that. And uh, with that, thank you so much for your time, James. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Thank um, you, Emma. Thank you all for watching. Uh, if you uh, would like to see more uh, and of the EULA experience and all reporters uh, visit runnow.com.